Well, hey everybody, my name is Faith and welcome to church. We're in the middle of a series called The Red Letters, where we're looking at the words of Jesus. But what I think we've seen in this series so far, and we're gonna continue to learn, is that Jesus said some pretty unexpected things. And that if we really apply them to our lives, it can lead us in crazy directions. So today, we're gonna have a conversation about hypocrisy. That's right. Jesus had a lot to say about hypocrisy and specifically hypocrisy within the church. And so who better to talk about church hypocrisy than two pastors? So I brought along a couple of my friends, Pat Brennan and Betsy Sunny, to have this conversation. So I'd love to start by have you guys introduce yourselves and then tell me what comes to mind when you hear the word hypocrisy and the church. Yeah, my name is Pat Brennan and I am our Central Students Pastor. And what comes to mind for me is just saying one thing or acting one way and then completely believing or doing another thing. So just a, something that's disjointed between how we're living and what we believe or how we're living what we're saying. Oh man, how do I, how do I top that? I don't know, I took the <laughs> answers. <laughs> just like, yeah. I think there was like one right answer and you took it. <laughs> um, my name is Betsy Sunny, I'm the online campus pastor. And when I think about hypocrisy, I really do see it as like an avenue for hiding. Mm -hmm. There's something incongruent about like what we're saying, what we're doing, but I think a lot of times we use hypocrisy to hide from actually like being who we are. Because there's something like maybe vulnerable or scary about doing that. That's really good. Yeah. It was way better. I mean, you know, I had, I had to come up with a plot. You took my answer. <laughs> I can tell this conversation is going to be awesome. But I want to frame up our conversation by first starting about uh, talking about two different types of hypocrisy. I think there's unintentional hypocrisy. That is, we say we believe something and we do another and maybe we're not even aware of it. And that's probably the type of hypocrisy that most of us think that we would fall into, right? But then there's intentional hypocrisy and that is where we intentionally are doing something different than what we say we believe. But I think often we like to claim unintentional hypocrisy for ourselves and intentional hypocrisy for everybody else, right? So tell us what you think about that tension. I mean, it's so easy, right, to be like, oh, I, would, I wouldn't I would do it intentionally. I would never, I would never, but everyone else is wrong, right? right? And I think, uh, I think that's a part of the lying to ourselves, hmm. right? This, it's a really easy to look at somebody else and be like, oh, Pat, Pat's obviously being a hypocrite, but, oh, but Betsy was. That's Betsy why you was, invited both of us. <laughs> that's right, I just want to like balance this <laughs> yeah. out. But Betsy, like, wouldn't, uh, Betsy didn't know better, like, mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of times that could be just our misguided way about it, um, but a lot of times I think it's just we don't want to confront the things that we have to take accountability for. Yeah. yeah, I think our own hypocrisy, which I know we will get to, bugs us, but it's far easier to make excuses because we don't want to confront that reality. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we see hypocrisy in others, I actually think there's something about what frustrates us about ourselves, like Bessie referenced, just kind of what the hiding is, but it's way easier to feel like we can take action on that mm -hmm. because oh, I see them being hypocritical and I hate that, I see, hate the way it's uh, affecting their world. But when I do it, I make excuses for why it's not that bad because that would cause me to confront some things that are really difficult that yeah. either I'm not ready to or just is hard and I feel really guilty about. Yeah, so good. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In this conversation, I think our hope is that we kind of hold the mirror up to ourselves. I think in the conversation, it can be really easy to think, okay, we're gonna be you know, looking at what everyone else is doing and how they're hypocritical. But really the challenge in this conversation is to turn it back on ourselves and say, how am I being hypocritical? And so that's what we're hoping to do today. Now we're framing this conversation around Matthew 23, the words of Jesus, when he actually talks about different hypocrisies, specifically with religious leaders or the church. And he, uh, in Matthew 23, starting in verse 13, Jesus talks about these seven woes where he kind of condemns different things that church leaders are doing. Um, but really when we boil those down, those statements kind of boil down into four different types of hypocrisy. So I wanna talk through those four different types and then ask you about how we see those within the church and kind of what do we do about them? So the first hypocrisy that I wanna talk about is the hypocrisy of enthusiasm. And this is the idea that sometimes we can be really excited about something like super hyped about church or serving or social justice, but then there's actually no transformation that's happening beneath the surface. And so I'd love to hear kind of how you think about that and how you might see it within the church. Yeah, no pressure. Go I've ahead. never seen it. No, I, never, no, never. Um, Just like eyes closed, like the induction. I mean, we, I work with students. We, we, we can yeah. inadvertently fall into this all the time. Uh, so mm -hmm. we have a camp season coming up. And I think an important question for us to ask is, are, we can be excited about the fun we're going to have at camp, or we yeah. can be excited about some cool stuff we're going to have at church. Mm -hmm. But are we equally, if not more excited about uh, 
the transformation that you can have and encounter in Jesus, or are we trying to use those extra things to compensate for it? Mm. Because I'm telling you, you should be so pumped about who Jesus is, but come because we're doing these fun things. Right. Then in reality, what we're saying is like, it's not that exciting. Right. But I think you can actually have both. You can actually go, it's gonna be super fun because we're gonna do some fun stuff. And uh, the thing we really want you to encounter is that. So we've actually been asking some of those questions because mm. I think all too often in the time I've been in with students and in the church, we tend to go, how can we compensate? How can we really right. get people in yeah. versus how can we actually help whatever we're doing point people towards Jesus? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's not even like a next gen thing because mm. we talk about spiritual formation with adults and we talk about, hey, we want you to do these steps. We want you to hop into these environments and those things, those avenues are really great. But as much as we're enthusiastic about it, are you being transformed by the Spirit? Yeah. Are you learning things about God? Are you changing because of the fact that you're in community or that you serve or that you give? Like we, we see these as good things, but we want you to really be more oriented towards like what's, what does the pursuit of holiness mm. look like? Mm. And actually, how do you actually know Jesus mm -hmm. and the personhood that he is? Yeah, that's super good. Yeah. I love it. So another hypocrisy that Jesus talks about in these seven woes is this hypocrisy of emphasis. And that is that we spend a lot of time talking about things that are really, really important. We talk about how we spend our time, how we spend our money, the way that we worship, things like that. But then there are other things that are equally as important that we just kind of minimize for different reasons mostly because I think they're uncomfortable to talk about, but that in and of itself is a hypocrisy when we're not like actively living out our faith and living out what it means to follow Jesus in a way that he called us to. So I'd love to hear again, how you see that within the church and what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I think this kind of allows us to ask the question, like what, what do I prioritize my values in? Yep. Uh, I think, you know, for depending on like what generation we're talking about, we can take any topic and say, oh, you really care about this but maybe it's in a reactive way, mm. right? Like, have, yeah. have you seen that? Yep. Yeah, I actually think, it's interesting to bring up generations. I actually think that a lot of what you see in the next generation of church leaders or church congregants is a reaction to, hey, you should have cared about this more. It's a counteraction that em emphasis. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I hate this one because it's actually really hard. Yeah. Like, the, the reality is there are things that are easy to emphasize for right. others. And um, we do that all the time because when we are emphasizing everything equally, then it feels like nothing has value. And right. yet, I think what you see uh, Jesus doing is actually highlighting the fact that uh, there are multiple things important, not just the ones that are easier for us. Right, yeah, right. And like, what is that care? Like, what is that informed by? Right. right? If the reactivity is like from an outside influence, is that really the, the true care that Jesus calls yeah, us yeah. to? Yeah. Right, when really like, there, that is that transform transformative thing of, oh, because this is a value of God's, this is a value I should also like yep. pursue as well. Let's talk about the next hypocrisy, which is the hypocrisy of tradition. And that is when we feel like the tradition or the symbol becomes more important than what we are remembering or what we are celebrating, kind of what is symbolized by that tradition. And I think we as the church probably fall into that category collectively a lot. What? We overemphasize, I know, shocking, <laughs> overemphasize some type of symbol or tradition at the expense of what it was actually meant for. And I think the really the danger of this hypocrisy as the church is that it can actually keep people from encountering Jesus in a way that is accessible to them. So tell me your thoughts. Yeah, I, uh, I think that we have a tendency to, as people attach meaning to different symbols and things, and that can be really helpful. And then what we see over time is, uh, negative meanings and connotations and, and feelings and interactions can mm -hmm. also be attached to it. If you've had right. a terrible experience with a church and they did a tradition, even though that tradition inherently might be a great thing historically, mm -hmm. it can be really difficult and painful. Right. And yeah. I'm really curious, Betsy, because as our digital campus pastor, we're like living in a new sort of tradition yeah. and new digital age that probably people have different mm -hmm. feelings about. How does that even play in this space? I love that. I think it all boils down to attachment, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we think about the ways like church always has this, this, and this. But a lot of times when you ask people, well, why do we sing this song? Why do we pray this prayer? Why? And a lot of people can't always tell you why. Right. Yeah. Not because it has, doesn't have meaning, but because we haven't attached that meaning and discipled people towards that meaning. Mm -hmm. So I think the beauty of digital and really the beauty of like doing ministry is being asked like the meaning of like what it means to connect with God does not change. Yeah. The expression and how we do that, we get to we get to ask that questions. But a lot of times, the attachment to tradition is like, you know, we got asked a question one time. Is like, well, if you're digital, 
do you remember this? How how can you hold babies? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's a valid you, question. It's a valid question, <laughs> right? Valid question. Like, and we're not. <laughs> and I think the reality was like, okay, yes, unless we figure out some cool VR technology to hold yep. babies, that's, that's one thing. But it's like, but can we actually empower you to be a great neighbor yeah. so that you can support the local moms in your community? Can we disciple yeah. you to be like, maybe you're not holding a baby at church, mm-hmm. but maybe you're supporting like people in your community by watching their babies. Right. Right. And how do you actually build that like kingdom mindset? Right. Even though, yeah, on a screen, you may not be able to do that. Right. It's the same value, but the way that that value is expressed, right. which would be a tradition, that might change. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's really good. Because I do think, like, to your point, sometimes we, we attach meaning so much and you don't question it, mm-hmm. you end up doing things and there's like this vapidness right. to it. Yeah, it's the vehicle that should get you closer to Jesus. It's not a replacement. And I think you see that throughout mm-hmm. church. And the minute that they start become replacements, mm-hmm. it's actually when you see the tradition leading you to right. the hypocrisy. That's so good. Yeah. Exactly. Nailed it. Awesome. All right, last one. We're going to talk about the hypocrisy of the exteriors. And I saved this one for last because I think it's actually uh, the most obvious one when we think about hypocrisy. It's the idea that we present in a way that is actually different from how we are living or the values that we hold. Um, And again, this is one that we probably see most often in other people, but have a really hard time seeing in ourselves. And so I'm going to invite both of you to be vulnerable with us and our entire Willow family um, and talk us through how you have actually seen this hypocrisy show up in your own lives. Love it. Can't talk about hypocrisy without putting ourselves on blast. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, I had a mentor, um, Dr. John Hambrick, he used to say, um, the best place to hide from God is working at a church. Mm. And I've been in ministry for the last 12, almost only like 13 years. And I think there have been seasons of my life where that attachment to, we, we just, this is the way it goes. Mm-hmm. This is how your spiritual formation is. You just got to do it and do it and do it. And you kind of, I had to like look at myself and be like, but am I, do I know God? Mm. Am I connecting with him? Like, and being okay with broadening that, what is, uh, what do I need to look at in terms of like practice to actually connect with Jesus versus what felt like checking off a a checklist. And sometimes people will tell you like, that's fine. You just have to do it. But I'm like, but wait, if it doesn't mean anything, then do I? So that that has been like a a thing like I'm constantly aware of. Am I genuine in my pursuit Mm. uh, of my relationship with Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned like a mentor. I think uh, people who you trust are the best people to point it out because they don't care if you're upset about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and my counselor and I uh, talk about this a lot, actually, because I am someone who can and has been consumed with, like, how, do I, how am I going to look? Mm. Uh, we, we joke before we film this, like, oh, was, was I wearing the right stuff? Like, is yeah. this, like, yeah. okay? Or we and, the memo. <laughs> and, and the reality is, I think, there's an, it's okay. Like, I've had to come to, it's okay to, like, actually um, to care about, care about that. Yeah. Yeah. But am I doing that to compensate for how I'm really showing oh, up? Good. And... Uh, there have been plenty of times, I think not only in person, but when we talk about digital, like what does social media look like? How am I showing up um, in place with other people? And do I have to be this person or mm-hmm. can I really be myself? And you had mentioned hiding so early on. Mm-hmm. So much of that is I'm hiding either what I don't want people to know, what I feel guilty about, what I feel shamed about, yeah. all of the things that Jesus addressed. Right. And yet I think just an important question to go, is this really authentically me or am I really trying to compensate? And I've realized that even being in a place where I'm teaching and preaching and on stages, that sometimes I'm trying to compensate mm. for not being enough, content enough that God's put me in this place or I'm accepted and loved by Jesus, but how will people respond to me? Yeah. And it's hard. I will promise you, I do not do that perfectly. Uh, <laughs> and it's it's a really hard thing to journey through that I would imagine it's not just isolated to people who are right. in ministry. That's, That's everyone's journey. Yeah. So. Because it boils down to sincerity. Yeah, absolutely. Like, are you, can you really be like, who like who are you really? Yeah. yeah. Right? And can that person actually show up in mm. these spaces? Yeah. I I had to shift. I remember one shift I made when I started, when I was teaching our high schoolers and junior hires, that when I would talk about what Jesus is calling us to do, I would use us, not them. Because mm. often it's like, God wants you to do these yeah. things. And that actually immediately became a, yeah. oh, this is about all of us. And yeah. it's actually really helpful for me. I do yeah. that very intentionally. Um, and I think that, again, in this space, if you're coming into our space for the first time, you're watching this for the first time, uh, and it looks like um, one thing and we aren't being sincere, then that's going to really turn, tune you off because you had mentioned right. as we introed. Uh, it's way easier to call the right. hypocrisy <laughs> of others. And I think right. it creates a safe space when you're first one to go, like, that's me too. It's me. Right. Yeah. It's all of us. Yeah. yeah. That's so good. 
Yeah, you know, throughout this entire conversation, we really began by talking about how we recognize hypocrisy in other people, whether that is the church or whether that is other people around us. But I think what we've heard throughout this conversation is that it is more challenging for us to recognize the hypocrisy within ourselves. But that is really what Jesus speaks to. So we're gonna jump into a conversation with our online campus pastor, Betsy Sunny, and she's gonna walk us through some wisdom of how do we encounter or this hypocrisy in ourselves and what do we do with it? So check this out. We have to consider the question, what did Jesus actually say? How do we determine if he's hateful or compassionate, weak or powerful, fraudulent, or really the son of God? By reading the words he actually spoke. Jesus spoke words so powerful that the dead came back to life. He spoke controversial and even harsh words to the religious elite, compassionate words to the broken and disenfranchised, and tough challenges to those who follow him. Jesus made a radical claim and said he is the way, the truth, and the life. What do you say? All right, so today's focus is in Matthew 23, and the subject is the Pharisees. Now, I know the Pharisees are the poster child for hypocrites. And we love to read this chapter and be like, those hypocrites, the worst. Those Pharisees, the worst. And the reality is, we are those Pharisees. And now I know what your temptation is, but I don't act like them. Jesus is really harsh with those guys. But the reality is there's so much about um, the way that we see ourselves in the Word of God and how our posture might shift if we saw ourselves in the Pharisees. Because I'm willing to bet that we'd be more gentle than if we were just thinking of them as the Pharisees themselves. Because, you know, I was doing this quick Google search and are Christians hypocrites? The internet seems to think so, but the internet has a lot of strong opinions on things. But there was an article that popped up in my search and the title alone was from the, the Tennessean. It kind of struck out to me. And it was, are Christians hypocritical? Maybe, sure. But most are flawed, striving for the freedom of surrender. And it stuck out to me because it was compassionate. So I'm gonna do a little wordplay here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch up the title. Are Pharisees hypocrites? Maybe, sure, some of them are. <laughs> but most are flawed, striving for the freedom of surrender. Quick 45 second New Testament history on the Pharisees. They were a group of people who formed a new sect under Judaism, focused, almost hyper-focused on the rites, rituals of maintaining purity as a way of pleasing God. So we already see off the bat, if we're paying attention, that part of this, right, is a attempt an attempt to merge their identity with pursuing purity. This control that they want to have as the subject matter experts on purity and what it's like to actually follow God. And we, we see that harshness on Jesus, not on the Pharisees, but on the behavior of hypocrisy itself. So let's get into it. We start off in verse three. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. Hypocrisy produces a false sense of holiness. Jesus is actually being ironic <laughs> in this verse. He's saying they don't even do what they say. So don't do what they do because they, they do nothing, right? And the Pharisees had mistaken influence for holiness, right? Um, we see that, right, in the ways that they showed up with people, in the ways that they held the rule and the law. And for us, we get to ask ourselves that question. What have I mistaken for the pursuit of holiness? Is it power? Is it control? Is it feeling secure or feeling safe? Because here's the thing, this was an attempt on the Pharisees' part to pursue holiness that resulted in an incongruency of their character. We jump into verse five. 
They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Hypocrisy wants us to focus more on doing rather than being. By now, you're probably getting the point. I'm gonna ask you, like, what are the ways that you try to overcompensate by doing than seeing? Because for the Pharisees, it was all about the appearance, right? Of being a good religious person. But their hearts were vapid and empty. I love what Pat kind of talked about in our panel is that he was, he was talking about this like insecurity that he felt and how he made up for it. He overcompensated for it, for wanting to look a certain way. And the reality is we all do that. Sometimes we're feeling insecure. We don't feel safe within ourselves or we feel like we have to prove something to somebody else. So we make up, right? The person that we think we ought to be or we overcompensate by doing so much. And here's the reality. Jesus was calling them to be, to be okay with being and really to kind of come out of hiding, right? That the doing, the doing, the constant doing was just an attempt uh, to hide, right? And I think when we hold that, it's like, we can maybe be a little bit more gentle about it. And finally, in verse eight, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. The Pharisees did not see themselves as peers to the people that they serve. And when Jesus says this, he's establishing like the actual hierarchy. There is God, our Father, Abba, and then we are brothers. And in doing so, right, when we think through the lens of like what it means to be a hypocritical person, there is this air, there's this arrogance that we think that we're better than others, right? You see the, like, the idea is that the, the Pharisees didn't think they were broken, but they could easily call out the brokenness in others. That, that's what hypocrisy does to us. It, it recognizes others' brokenness, but not our own. But if we're actually able to equalize ourselves with one another, to see one another as brothers, as peers, well, it's hard to look down at you if I am standing next to you. And when we recognize our own brokenness, it actually gives us the empathy that we need to see one another for who we really are. And I think in that, we find the antidote to hypocrisy. It's sincerity, right? Jesus desires to see us. He knows who we really are. And in doing so, when we pursue sincerity, when we allow ourselves to be seen by God, we actually are given the capacity to surrender to Him. Because until we are sincere with God, it is impossible to surrender to God. And we actually see a really great example of this in another Pharisee. So remember when I said we're all Pharisees, right? Um, it's because we actually see how one Pharisee, that posture of surrender can actually change the way that he shows up. And in it, we can glean a posture that separated him from the rest of the Pharisees. So if you didn't get it by now, Nicodemus is a Pharisee and he it gets introduced in John chapter three. He, he goes in the middle of the night to find Jesus and he's like, hey, are you who you say you are? Because these are the things I've seen that you, you do. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a subject matter expert in the law, in history of tradition, where we see the Pharisees of Matthew 23 being like, you can't tell us anything. We know everything. We've got the cheat sheet. We've got the code. We have Nicodemus being willing to surrender his expertise and ask the questions to be curious. He wasn't sure if he believed yet, but he was willing to want to move towards Jesus to find out. And in it, we actually get one of the most famous Bible verses of all time. John chapter three, verse 16, a conversation that Jesus was having with a Pharisee. Only could have happened if when Nicodemus chose to surrender his expertise. In John seven, Jesus is getting himself in trouble with the Pharisees per 
And the Pharisees are talking about it, how angry they are, how are upset. And Nicodemus, a fellow Pharisee, shows up and he asks a question. Not defending Jesus outright, but creating enough advocacy that it would indirectly benefit Jesus. And in doing so, Nicodemus surrenders his influence. Where we see the Pharisees of chapter 23 wanting to maintain and hold that, that influence for safety and security. That's what they were afraid of losing. We see Nicodemus putting it on the line with his peers. And they respond pretty rudely back to him. So you know that didn't go super well. And for Nicodemus, that was a risk that he took. He, he's willing to say, I'm gonna surrender my influence because there is something about this Jesus worth surrendering to. And then finally, we see the last occurrence of Nicodemus as he's laying the body of Jesus to rest. He's one of two people that are found in that story. And he brings expensive myrrh and it's pretty laborious, right? It's timely to, to wrap the body of Jesus up to prepare him for this, this uh, burial rite. And what we see is a surrender of privilege, not only in um, what he has, right? But also in his position as well, because a Pharisee wouldn't serve someone that way. A Pharisee was not known to bury people and wrap them up. And we see, once again, it's done in secret. It's a huge risk. But Nicodemus is moving towards Jesus when he surrenders his privilege. Now, we don't really know what happens to Nicodemus. We don't know what his story ends up in. But we know that through this posture of surrender, he moves towards what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 23 when he highlights the antithesis of, of the other Pharisees. And we see a sincerity that, that shows up in surrender. And we see that you can be a hypocrite, but maybe you don't have to stay that way. Maybe there's something that you get to choose to be sincere about and come out of hiding. Maybe there's something that you choose to surrender so that you don't have to put on a mask. There is this like classic definition of hypocrisy that says, it's like putting on a mask for so long that you are convinced that that's your true identity. And Jesus is saying like, I, I see who you really are and I don't want you to hide anymore. I don't want you to have to cope uh, with your insecurities. I don't want you to have to put on airs and be arrogant. I want you to not do what you say. I want you to be an integral person. But we have to allow ourselves to be really seen by God and then be willing and to choose to surrender the parts of ourselves that we feel uncomfortable with, with Him, because we can trust Him. Because we believe that a relationship with Him, that actually being with Him will form us into the type of God followers that we really are. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, I get it. It's a hard thing to have to look at ourselves and ask the questions, are we hiding from God? Is our hypocrisy making it hard to connect with others? So I'll leave you with two questions. Is there anything that I need to be sincere with God about? And is there something that I need to surrender to Him? Because without sincerity, it is impossible to surrender to God. So we're gonna take the next couple of moments and step into a time of worship. Now I get it. If you're used to watching online, this might be the time that you wanna dip out. Please don't. <laughs> you may not even be the type of person that sings along or wants to worship. But I would encourage you to give yourself the space to look at these two questions, whether you choose to sing or not, right? Let these words, these voices, the music wash over you and allow you the time and the space to really be with God, your Father who loves you. And my hope is that throughout the week, you can take a next step on what it looks like to surrender to God. Before I eat.
song. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and pray. you get shy with me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord, yeah. come on my son, oh don't you get shy with me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and That was an incredible message from our online campus pastor, Betsy Sunny. I love how she really wrapped up the idea that without sincerity, we're unable to surrender to God. I think that's a really, really inspiring thing for us all to consider this week as we wrestle with hypocrisy in ourselves and in the world around us. You got it. You got it. Now we're going to take the moment to move into the time of our experience where we give back to God of our tithes and our offerings. As I think about this particular week, I'm thinking about what's about to happen in the life of our church. Every summer, we send literally thousands of students, junior high and high school, to camp. And it is one of the most life-changing, transformational experiences of what we get to do and be a part of in the lives of young people. And part of what we do in moments like these as we give is we get to fuel ministries and investment in the lives of these, these teenagers who are experiencing God in a fresh and new way. And really, the way we talk about it around here is they're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church today. And we have a very important opportunity to continue to invest in this particular group of people. So as you give, I'd love for you to think about how you potentially can trust God and partner with God in a difference-making way in the lives of students. And so as you think about that, there's a couple of ways that you can give around here. I would encourage you to go on willowcreek.org give, or you can also set up an automated gift through our Willow app. But thank you for your investment in really all that God is doing in the lives of, of people particularly our young people here at Willow. And church, we'd love to invite you to join us right back here online next week. We are gonna be celebrating all of the men in our life. Or if you're local here in Chicagoland, we'd love for you to check out one of our Chicagoland campuses. But until then, have a great week. We'll see you then.